بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful uh, we praise Allah we thank him uh, for his many bounties over us uh, being here in the on the 22nd night of Ramadan um, inshallah we're going to continue along the same theme and expound on that so we spoke previously about uh, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to attain it. And so today is going to be a tangent off of that, um, which is about the lives of the righteous people and uh, how they used to live their life. Because I think it's important for us to have a living model instead of something which is purely theoretical, right? So Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was asked, how was the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, she responded, uh, that his character was that of the Quran. He was a Quran yamshi al ard. He was a Quran that walked on the earth. And so, having the message embodied in a messenger, in in the in the form of flesh, in something that's tangible, somebody who you can interact with, um, is especially powerful. Um, and seeing examples of righteous people. Uh, is especially powerful because it also gives us a sense that that walaya, that connection, that uh, entering in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something which is attainable for each and every person. Otherwise, it seems something which is so uh, ethereal that, you know, it's, it's just something theoretical. It's not something real, not something that you can actually um, experience. Um, and also there's there's something to be gained by that experience. Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, I love the righteous people, although I'm not one of them. But perhaps through the association of some such righteous people, I'll attain um, that shafa'a, I'll attain that connection, I will attain that status just by virtue of association. So let's examine together a little bit the lives of the righteous people um, and, uh, and what their experience was. So a good place to start would be one quote from Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, in which he says, فَأَفْضَلُ النَّاسِ مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ وَخَوَّاصِ أَصْحَابِهِ فِي الْاقْتِصَادِ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ الْبَدَنِيَّةِ وَلِجْتِهَادِ فِي الْأَحْوَالِ الْقَلْبِيَّةِ فَإِنَّ سَفَرَ الْآخِرَةِ يُقْطَعُ بِسَيْرِ الْقُلُوبِ لَا بِسَيْرِ الْأَبْدَانِ So this is a very thought-provoking quote in which he says, the best people are those who adopt the way of the Prophet ﷺ and his most distinguished companions in being moderate in their physical acts of devotion. So notice here that the way in which their ibadah, their worship, al-badaniyya, the physical acts of devotion, their physical movement is not defined by extremes, but rather faliqtisad, right? And being moderate, balanced in their physical acts of devotion. And then on the other hand, waliqtisadi fil ahwal al but a complete devotion to refining their spiritual states, al-ahwal al-qalbiyya. So there's a high, a heightened sense of awareness as to the spiritual movement. And the reason for that is because the movement that matters is not the movement of the body. فَإِنَّ سَفَرَ الْآخِرَةِ For the journey after, يُقْطَعُ بِسَيْرِ الْقُلُوبِ It's traversed by the hearts, not by the bodies. So the journey that we go through in this world and entering into the Akhirah, it is a journey of the soul. It's not a journey of the body. And so attaining success in that journey is not going to be marked by extremes in overexertion with respect to the physical body, but rather it's going to be marked by effort and energy, which is expended in moving your spiritual state. Um, so in order to understand that, we're going to examine, inshallah, 
um, you know, the lives of the righteous people, um, how their devotion formed their identity, how they approach things. You know, I, I mentioned Imam Shafi'i before. Another one of his uh, poetry, another line, uh, which indicates the idea of, of Sakina, which we talked about before, the idea of Tuma'nina, being in a state of inner peace, being in a state of inner calm, and what it is that actually brings a person that feeling of quietude, right? So one of the things that he said was, وَلَا حُزْنِ يَدُومْ وَلَا سُرُورْ وَلَا بُؤْسٌ عَلَيْكَ وَلَا رَخَاءٌ إِذَا مَا كُنْتَ ذَا قَلْبٍ قَنُوعٍ فَأَنْتَ وَمَالِكُ الدُّنْيَا سَوَاءٌ So neither happiness nor sadness persists, not even grief or luxury. As long as you have a content heart, you and the richest person are the same. You know, this is really thought provoking because many of us chase happiness um, and we believe that things are going to bring us happiness. So we create arbitrary conditions that if I have this, um, if I have X amount of money, it's going to make me happy. And then when we actually achieve it, when we actually have it, then that thing doesn't bring us the happiness. It doesn't bring us the joy that we suspected it was going to bring us. And then we actually realize that, that the greatest commodity, the greatest thing that a person can enjoy in their life is not something which is tangible. Um, the greatest ni'ma, that bounty, is that state of qana'ah, that state of being content with that with which you have. So because what we think that a certain thing is going to bring us joy, and then when we actually have it, then we're actually more scared about losing that thing. And then we have more paranoia. Um, and then in the end, um, it actually brings us a heightened state of anxiety. And in reality, that thing, rather than making us happier, becomes the very reason for which uh, we're in a heightened state of anxiety and worry. Um, so Imam Shafi'i is, is showing us that, that if you have a transient period of stress or difficulty or hardship, the believer understands that that transitory test, right, is something that you're experiencing at that moment. And that the, the challenge is, is to, find, um, to find the positive in that experience, regardless of the circumstances. And understanding that your happiness is not as connected to your circumstances at, as you think that your actual joy and happiness stem from how you respond to those inputs, how you respond to those circumstances rather than the circumstances themselves. You know, one of the early generations of Muslims saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream. And it's very important to recognize that report of somebody seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream it's not going to, by definition, it's not going to be a hadith. It's not going to be a proof, right? Because this is not a person who is a contemporary of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't hear him say this, but it's something that they experienced in a dream. So it's only beneficial if we find it beneficial, but it's not a proof of anything. So he saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream and he said to him, um, give me counsel, give me advice. And then in the dream, the Prophet said, he said that Whoever's two consecutive days are the same is defrauded. If you're tomorrow, is the same as yesterday, you're defrauded. Whoever's today is worse than his yesterday is cursed. Whoever has not sought ways to increase his devotional acts is decreasing. And whoever is decreasing, death is better for him. So what this is suggesting is that um, the believer is constantly in a state of awareness that we are in a state of flux, right? So the word for heart in Arabic is qalb, right? And qalb means the thing which turns, yan qalb, right? So the word for the heart and the word for turning and twisting and changing is 
is, is the same, is qalb, qalaba. Qalaba means to change. And the reason for that is because our emotional states are constantly in a state of change and influx, right? So sometimes you wake up very happy, then something happens to you, then you become very sad, and your state changes completely the opposite of that. And Iman, if we if we are more aware of it, is very similar, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Al Imanu Yazidu wa Yanqus, right? So Iman it increases and decreases, right? And if you if you realize that it's it's increasing and decreasing, so you're not going to stress out by by a moment of of, of a crisis in which you're experiencing some weakness of spirit. Also, with regard to this dunya, you're going to realize that if I'm suffering from a momentary lapse um, or something bad happens to me, that I'm not going to get overly upset about or depressed about it. Right? Allah mentions this in the Quran. Don't become overly uh, anxious and do not become overly despondent over that which hasn't reached you. Right? And don't become overly cheerful or overly boastful about the things which you have received. Right? Because many of us, if something good happens to us, we become arrogant or we become too invested. We assume that that ni'mah, we assume that that bounty is going to be extended and it's never going to go away and that it can't be taken away from us. And then if something is taken away from us, we become overly upset and overly sad about it. And the reality is that, as one of the scholars said, Kullu ni'matin manqusa, right? So each and every ni'mah, every bounty in this world is actually deficient, right? Because even if Allah gives you something in this world, it can be taken away. And there's always going to be something wrong with it. If you have a lot of knowledge, there's going to be some knowledge that you don't have. If you have a lot of wealth, there's going to be somebody else who's wealthier than you. No matter what it is, that uh, that you have or that you receive, it's never going to have perfection because perfection is a quality which belongs in the akhirah. And there are many of the early generations and there are many people of all ages and all places who have uh, devoted their life to, uh, you know, their lives to Allah's sake. So I'll give a couple example, like uh, Sheikh Dr. Abu, Abu Yusur al-Abidin, he was the Grand Mufti of Syria and Egypt. He was one of the great authorities of the time. Uh, when the leader at that time wanted to privatize all the privately uh, owned companies and to nationalize them, he asked the Sheikh to give him a fatwa to allow it. But Imam Abu Yusr, he refused because he said that innocent Muslims would be robbed of their wealth and they would be cheated as a result of that nationalization. And they tried to bribe him and he was threatened and he was told that he would lose his post if he continued to refuse. And in the end, he said, I will happily resign from my position because I prefer sitting to home, sitting at home and being a nobody rather than being a grand mufti who sells his deen in order to acquire the dunya. More recently, uh, Sheikh Omar al-Kiswani, the, the Imam of, of Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, he said, uh, the government offered me a role to be the head of religious affairs. They offered me an enormous salary, cars, my own security, chauffeurs, a massive house, and an easy life if I relocated. But I turned it down. They thought I was crazy and said that normal people would do anything for that job. But I replied, I can't take the job because I refuse to leave Masjid al-Aqsa and its people. I could have six times my salary if I wanted to. But of course, his intention is to serve the people and to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that position. Um, and there, there are many other examples. There's the last uh, Sheikh al-Islam of the uh, Ottoman Empire, Sheikh Mustafa Sabri. He migrated to Egypt after the end of, uh, of that rule uh, because he didn't want to praise the governments at that time. And it was said that he was so poor that he would starve and feel the pangs of hunger at night. And people would be very sad to see his condition, but he would say, it's better to starve than to praise and work for systems and rulers who want to change, distort, and destroy the deen. And so the idea is that uh, in the examples that I mentioned, there are people who 
even though ostensibly, if you look at it from the outside, it looks like they made very poor decisions. It looks like they missed out on the comforts of this life. But in reality, they had that inner satisfaction. They were able to go to sleep at night knowing that they had done the right thing. And so our you know, righteous ulama, they know the value of this deed. They understand the trust, the amana with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's better to sleep with an empty stomach, but even with an empty stomach, but with a full soul, right? Rather than to sell their soul for temporary pleasures. And you'll see that a lot of people will experience that where they'll make certain career choices. They'll make decisions with regard to their family. They'll prioritize their, their children. And it might cause a little bit of discomfort or it might cause you know, some missed out opportunities. And for the, for the believer, that state of satisfaction with your, you know, your share in this world, um, while at the same time not becoming complacent, of course, is very important. One of the hikam, the aphorisms of Ibn Ata'illah, and, and this, is, this is an especially beautiful one um, and, and a beneficial one. He says, Sometimes he gives while depriving you, and sometimes he deprives you in giving. And when he opens up your understanding of deprivation, deprivation becomes the same as giving. So I'm going to say that again, just so everybody can absorb it. Sometimes he gives while depriving you, and sometimes he deprives you while giving. So sometimes Allah can give you but actually the thing that he's giving you is a form of deprivation because the thing which you're receiving is actually not good for you. So in reality, that, that which you're receiving, you might be excited about, you might be happy about it, but you'd be far better out not receiving it. And sometimes he deprives you in giving. So he doesn't, he, he doesn't give you anything, uh, but in fact, it's a great bounty. So by withholding that in the end, it's actually a benefit to you. But what that requires is bab al-fahm, right? So the only person who, who's able to appreciate that is the one who Allah has opened up the understanding of that deprivation. And once you open up that understanding, then the deprivation becomes the same as giving. Because then you realize that our construct about good and bad, positive, negative, that these are arbitrary because in reality, we don't even know what is good for us. There could be things that happen in our life and we think that that is the worst thing to happen to us. But it, it, it could be that because of that situation, you, a crisis was averted, an accident didn't happen, or you were focused in the home, right? Um, and actually you were able to invest in relationships and because you were available and you were investing in those relationships, you found a that's, that's far more important than that opportunity um, you know, which you initially cared so much about. And so the connection between what's good, what is giving and what is deprivation is, is completely arbitrary because our knowledge is... Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أُوتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And you have not been given from knowledge except for very little. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that all of the knowledge that exists in the world if we were to combine it and add it all together and in comparison to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like if you had a huge ocean and you took a needle and you were to dip that needle into the water and just that very minuscule amount of water that would cling to that needle. That's the amount of knowledge that we have in comparison to the ocean of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's limitless knowledge, right? He is Al-Alim Al-Hakim, the all-knowing and the all-wise. Sheikh Abdul Bari Yahya uh, from Seattle, uh, once uh, he, uh, he said something that, that uh, is still fresh in my mind. He said that <clears throat> fish hooks provide free worms and mousetraps provide free trees. 
but be careful of the dunya and its temptations. And, and what that indicates to us is that, yes, there are things which are easily accessible and easily available. So for example, for a lot of young people, they might experience college and they might um, experience that feeling of the things that are prohibited and haram being widely available. They might struggle in seeing those temptations and, and try to, and struggle with the idea of like, well, why is this? Why do I have to withhold myself from these things which bring me pleasure, right? And which seem like good things because my association is that if it feels good, therefore it must be good, right? But for the person who's in a state of contentment regarding um, their situation in this world, so pleasure and happiness don't come together. So we have to disengage that connection between the hawa against our whims, against our shahawat, against our desires, and decouple that. So that way, those things are not the things which bring us joy. Those are not the things which bring us happiness. And that being, having that ma'iyya, being with Allah, right? As Ibn al-Jawzi, he said that the believers are, are they, they act for Allah, right? So they do everything for the sake of Allah. They do it by Allah, meaning that they do things the right way, according to what Allah has commanded us to do. And they are with Allah, right? And so that meaning that they, Allah is the hand with which they hit with, the eyes that they see with, the ears that they listen with, right? So even though, right, um, they, they, they don't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as uh, this is maqam al-ihsan, right? Jibreel, uh, when he described ihsan to the Prophet sallam, right? Uh, the pro well, vice versa. He said, That you worship Allah as if you see him. So also, I want to, uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, but I, I wanted to open this up for any questions um, and, and any discussion. Um, I know it might be difficult since we're doing it over Zoom. If in person, if there are any uh, questions, then we can pass that along. Otherwise, if there's anyone in the Zoom meeting, you can go ahead, unmute yourself, um, and you can ask your question um, as well. So I'm going to continue, but um, please feel free, ask your question or if you want the conversation to move in a certain direction, we can take that inshallah as well. Um, so um, if there is, please, please go ahead. Um, so Ibn al-Jawzi, um, he alludes to this uh, reality and, and the idea of our calculus of what's good and what's bad being warped. And he says that know that if people are impressed with you, then in reality, they are impressed with the beauty of Allah covering up your sins. And so this is a whole different worldview in which if people are, you know, if people are satisfied with us, we understand that, oh, that's a gift from Allah. If we acquire some wealth, then we understand that, okay, that is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we shouldn't adopt that uh, that attitude that innama utituhu ala ilm, right? So the disbeliever, they attribute anything bad to Allah. That, oh Allah, why did you do this to me? I think many of us have experienced that or we've heard it from others. That attitude that every time there's, there's something negative, then we associate, we attribute that to Allah rather than to our own deficiencies. But when something good happens to us, then we say, you know, innama utiduhu ala ilm. I got it because I'm the best, um, because I deserve it, because I worked hard, because I'm the most knowledgeable, right? And so we associate our success um, with our own capabilities rather than the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that facilitated that and actually brought that about. And once we come to this realization, then we realize that the spiritual state <clears throat> is not dictated by a certain action. You don't 
say something you know th there's no like some people that have this idea of walaya of that oh these uh people who are very close to allah there are these saints that have this special status because they're so and so and something magical happens but in reality no there's something which cannot easily be quantified if we were to uh, task ourselves to examine who is the ideal companion if one can exist who would you think of most likely you're going to think of abu bakr radiallahu an right and we know from the prophet sallam the status and the iman and the importance of abu bakr as siddiq right the one that affirms the truth and if we examine his life we come to the realization abu bakr was not poor like abu dhab he was not like abu huraira the two of them they would spend the whole day with the prophet sallam they would okay so are we looking to wrap up at three or or did we want to go a little bit longer um because i i think we're going to go uh go about uh, a few minutes longer right uh, because we ended we ended early yesterday so this way we can so I have some additional time so we'll go five minutes inshallah okay. if that's all right and then we'll 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 follow with the qiyam so when we think of abu bakr he wasn't poor like abu dhar like abu huraira but he was better than them so poverty is not the measure of the strength of that companion because abu bakr was not poor he wasn't tortured like khabbab or bilal or sumayya and Yasser, but he was better than them. He wasn't severely injured in battle like Talha or Abu Ubaidah or Khalid ibn al Walid, but he was better than them. He, was, he didn't die as a shaheed like Hamza or Umar or Uthman or Ali, but he was better than them. So, what was the secret that made Abu Bakr better than all of those other companions? Bakr ibn Abdullah al-Muzani, he said that Abu Bakr didn't precede them due to offering a lot of prayers and fasting. So Abu Bakr did not precede them because he prayed more or he fasted more, but because of something that settled in his heart. It's the actions of the heart. So their actions of the body and their actions of the heart. That's what made his faith outweigh the faith of the entire ummah. So there's an intangible, a feeling, an action of the heart, a movement that is the essence of this deen. The movement of the heart, the feeling of sincerity, the sincerity of iman. And that is the thing which in these last 10 nights of Ramadan, that is the thing which should be moving. So yes, we're moving our body in salah, Allahu Akbar. We do our bowing, we do our prostration. But don't just allow your body to move. Move the state of your heart. Allow yourself to shed a tear out of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shed a tear when you hear the beautiful recitation of the Quran out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's a great gift to have a heart, a qalb, yakhsha, that trembles. Skin that shudders with the taqashairu min hujulud alladheen yakhshawna rabbahum. Skin that shudders at the recitation of the Quran. And ayn tadma eyes that shed tears for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's mentioned in Ibn Majah and in Kitab al-Zuhd. He said, there is no believer who has wept tears out of fear of Allah, be they as small as a fly, but enough to wet their cheeks for whom Allah has forbidden the eternal fire. So uh, the message inshallah for today is that the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a physical manifestation and it's found in the righteous people which is that uh, they were not just moved in their actions but they were moved in their heart they were engaged in the movements and the actions of the heart in addition to the actions and the and the and the work of the body and that is the most comprehensive approach that is the most the deepest connection that one can have with Allah Azza wa Jal is that um, if you really want to attain that, that station of the people that we talked about, 
then your entire thought process. You have to change how you approach the happenings and events which are occurring to you in your life and understanding that there is a divine wisdom behind everything that happens and that as a believer that ajiba amrul mu'min that everything is good if something bad happens to you then you're patient and it's good for you and if something good happens to you then you think allah alhamdulillah and you're grateful <coughs> for the good that transpires and that's also good for you so on this you know 22nd night of ramadan we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is going to uh, accept all of our fasting our prayer our ibadah and our worship we ask that you know with every verse of the quran with every harf there's halawa there's a sweet right and with every kalima with every word of the quran there's karama there is a there is a spiritual opening and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he not only moves our bodies and opens our bodies but that he also opens our hearts and moves our hearts to being close to him and and towards acceptance that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept and put all of our good deeds on our scale uh, of mizan of hasanat on the day in which nothing will avail us neither wealth uh, nor any children illa man atallaha biqalbin salim except for the one who comes before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart uh, may Allah accept from you and from me and from all of us. And inshallah, I wish all of you a blessed night, Mubarak, uh, a, a night full of blessing. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'an marhuma wa ja'al tafarruqana min ba'di tafarruqan ma'asuma wa la taj'al baynana wa la minna shaqiyan wa la mahruma. Bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.